At MSC Sleep, our 24 highly trained PAP resupply specialists are dedicated to educating patients on optimal PAP therapy practices and assisting with supply replenishment. We've created two programs for our 90,000 plus patients called AutoShip and Courtesy Contact. AutoShip automatically sends supplies when eligible, while Courtesy Contact provides personalized reminders via phone, text, or email. In the previous year, we've introduced the SNAP app to allow our patients to monitor current orders, place new orders, and update their information effortlessly. To order supplies or to learn more about the MSC Sleep Refresh program, please contact us today via chat at www.medicalservicecode.com or by calling 866-907-5337. Count on us for top-notch support and service for your PAP therapy needs. Good afternoon, everyone. We hope you are enjoying a full day of sleep respiratory education. This afternoon, we will provide sleep-specific lectures based on your enrollment in the sleep track. The speaker lineup is designed to further enhance your knowledge in the sleep medicine. Starting off our sleep series of lectures, we would like to welcome back Dr. Asim Roy. Currently practicing at the Ohio Sleep Medicine Institute in Dublin, Ohio as a medical director and research associate. Dr. Roy works in close collaboration with healthcare providers to deliver continuous coordinated sleep medicine care to adult and pediatric patients. Dr. Roy is highly involved in research related to sleep medicine and has served as a primary and sub-investigator in a multitude of research trials. He has authored many publications, textbooks over the past 18 years and has also participated in numerous speaking engagements. As someone who is a big proponent of education, Dr. Roy also trains medical professionals in sleep disorder management. He is a member of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, American Academy of Neurology, and American Medical Association. Thank you to Dr. Roy for presenting again at our forum. As you listen to the upcoming lecture, feel free to submit your questions to Dr. Roy under the engagement tab. Don't forget to complete a and submit your evaluation after each lecture. Well, good day. Uh, my name is Asim Roy. I'm a sleep neurologist based in Columbus, Ohio at the Ohio Sleep Medicine Institute. I've been practicing for about 17 years now. I uh, did my neurology residency at Georgetown and went on to do my sleep medicine fellowship at Cleveland Clinic. I currently have a practice here in Columbus called Ohio Sleep Medicine Institute. We are a private institution. We have uh, seven healthcare providers and we see a wide array of sleep disorders. Um, and I'm excited to be here today to talk about kind of the modernization of sleep testing. Um, as you know, over the last five to 10 years, there's been a huge explosion of technology and advancements in the field of monitoring. Um, obviously, there's the whole uh, wellness and kind of uh, the whoops and the Fitbits of the world that, um, you know, uh, track sleep and other things like that that have unfortunately not been validated necessarily, but we, we're going to talk today about kind of all the new technologies that are coming out in the home sleep testing world that are FDA approved, that have been validated, and kind of understand the technology so you kind of have a better understanding when you see a report um, for a home sleep test, you kind of understand how is that monitored, how is that measured. Um, I do have a few disclosures. None of this should influence today's conversation, but I do get a lot of grant and money from research from numerous companies here, as well as consulting work and a speaker for a few of these companies. Again, none of these um, it, um, uh, disclosures should have an influence on today's conversation. So it's always nice to know kind of where we started as a field in sleep medicine. How did this all come about? Uh, what do we get out of polysomnography, which has been the gold standard for um, 40, 40 years now? And then kind of what's in the home sleep testing world and uh, what are what's kind of the technology behind them? 
So here's a quick history lesson. Um, you know, Dr. Kleitman, uh, uh, one of our most famous uh, sleep doctors, uh, sleep researchers from the University of Chicago, in the 1920s opened the first sleep lab. And really there was no huge monitoring done then, but it was more just to observe people during sleep. And then in 1956, you can see here, Professor uh, Burwell identified a condition known as obstructive sleep apnea. So it was 1956 when it was first identified. Obviously, we know Charles Dickens' book um, about Pickwickian syndrome, which was kind of that large uh, child who would fall asleep. Um, that was written in the late 1800s. So there's clear observation of sleep and snoring and sleep apnea for many, many years. Um, 1958, Dr. Lerner discovered melatonin, which was then understood to be the hormone responsible for our circadian rhythm, kind of our regulating our sleep-wake cycle. And then in 68, Alan Reichshoffen and Kales published the first guideline for determining sleep stages, which um, we still use today, you know, the R and K. Uh, there's been modifications, you know, we don't really call, uh, you know, the four non-REM stages, stage one, two, three, and four. Four and three are now combined into one stage called slow wave sleep. Um, and then there's REM sleep, obviously. And then in 1970, Dr. Dement founded the first sleep lab at Stanford University that was specifically focusing on studying sleep disorders. And then in 73, you can see here, Thomas Borkovec conducted cognitive behavioral therapy studies for insomnia, which again, are considered the gold standard for managing insomnia today. In 1975, the Associated Sleep Disorders, which later became the AASM, was founded. And in that same year, Dr. Dement and Dr. Karskanen um, created the multiple sleep latency test, which helped diagnose a variety of sleep disorders. Their original reason to do the MSLT was looking at circadian rhythm disorders, specifically delayed sleep phase. Um, in college students, you know, we all like to stay up late and wake up late if we could, or many of us do. Um, and this is when they started to do these nap tests through the day, and they actually were able to identify narcolepsy in, in a number of these people. And that's kind of how the criteria came about, kind of interesting. In 1977, Dr. Hari published Guidelines for Sleep Hygiene. In 1979, this is kind of a pivotal moment in the DME world. It's when Dr. Colin Sullivan uh, developed the first continuous positive airway pressure system. Basically, he rigged a vacuum cleaner, cleaner back, uh, reversed uh, the vacuum cleaner to deliver air pressure um, to create the CPAP. And then 1982, um, there's research now showing that REM sleep is one of the most important stages of sleep in terms of learning and recollection, so memory and things like that. It's a common misconception that REM sleep correlates with feeling restored or it's good quality. It's really slow wave sleep that correlates with that typically. So the term polysomnography was proposed by Holland, Dement, and Raynal in 1974, and it is by far the most commonly used test in the diagnosis of sleep disordered breathing. However, in the last five to seven years, home sleep testing is significantly taking over. And, you know, there's just a lot of rate limiting steps with the in-lab polysomnography compared to home testing where there's less uh, reliance on brick and mortar locations. And what is the polysomnography? It consists of simultaneous recording of multiple physiologic parameters related to sleep and wakefulness. So 
Why do we do a polysomnography? Obviously, we can look for sleep disorder breathing, such as obstructive sleep apnea, central sleep apnea, hypoventilation. Um, so things like that are helpful for polysomnography. We can also do PAP titrations. So um, CPAP titrations are less commonly done today, but um, due to the in, invention of auto CPAPs, but BiPAP titrations, ASV, or AVAP titrations, these are all common scenarios when we will probably need to bring someone into the sleep lab to, to monitor the treatment. Parasomnias are a common reason why we will bring someone into the sleep lab if we want to kind of further characterize sleepwalking or see if they're predisposed to sleepwalking. A common one we look for today is REM behavior disorder. And this is uh, where someone will act out their dreams. As you know, during REM sleep, uh, your muscles are completely paralyzed, so you can't really move. And in these individuals, uh, that control of shutting down the muscles is impaired, is affected, and now they have full muscle control. And so now they can actually act out their dreams. This can also have a serious implication where if you hear someone doing this, it could be a harbinger or pre, a, a predictor of them going on to develop Parkinson's or Parkinson-like disorder. So this does carry some serious uh, implications. Obviously, narcolepsy requires an in-lab polysomnography and then followed by an MSLT, a multiple sleep latency test. Neuromuscular disorders with sleep-related symptoms, obviously, often we really want to bring them into the lab if we can. Um, if they're having these weird confusional arousals or if they're shaking or tremoring or, you know, weird behaviors at night that might be seizures, we can characterize that during a polysomnography. And then PLMs, it's one of our main tools we have to identify if their leg movements are moving during the night. And remember, restless legs is an awake phenomenon and PLMs is during sleep. So just seeing PLMs during the night, you don't can't diagnose someone with restless legs because many people have PLMs without restless legs. Commonly, it can be tied to breathing issues. So if you have an apnea, the legs can twitch. And, um, and often, if you treat the apnea, the legs calm down uh, for many patients. So what are kind of the components of the polysomnography? We know the EEG, which is on the brain, the electroencephalogram. Typically, there's a minimum of three channels, a frontal, a central, and occipital lead. And then there's EOGs, which is the ocular uh, electrodes. These are two electrodes one on the left side that's below the outer canthus, right below the left eye. And then the right side is typically above the outer canthus. And this is really designed to look for rapid eye movements or slow rolling eye movements. As you know, during REM sleep, stands for rapid eye movements that looks like someone's watching a tennis match back and forth. And then slow Riley rolling eye movements can identify someone who might be drowsy as the eyes are drifting off. They will have slow movements. What else we see slow eye rolling movements is in patients with antidepressants on board. So if they have SSRI, if they have, you know, something like an SSRI or an SNRI, um, drugs can cause slow rolling eye movements. Um, EMG, so the muscle activity, we have uh, two areas that we monitor muscle activity at the chin, which is at the submentalis muscle. And this is where we're really looking for REM sleep and you see the atonia, the muscle tone go away and the eye movements are occurring. We know someone's dreaming at that point. They're in REM sleep. And then we have two EMGs on the anterior tibialis. So right on the, on the two front parts of the leg to look for the periodic limb movements as well.
And again, we know that there's absence and no tone during REM sleep. Even as we drift off, the tone goes down, but not to where it disappears, essentially, uh, like it does in REM sleep. We also have respiratory monitoring. We know there's airflow, and this is usually measured with two different types of sensors, a pressure transducer and a thermistor. Uh, the transducer is a little more sensitive. It's usually used to identify hypopneas. Um, and the thermistor, which uses temperature uh, alterations from breathing to determine if there's an apnea. The advantage of the thermistor is it can also detect mouth breathing. So the transducer and the thermistor together can really help you identify partial stoppages in breathing all the way to the frank apneas. We also have chest and abdomen belts, and this is to look at how well the chest is pumping. This is also going to help identify central sleep apnea if the chest isn't moving or the abdomen's not moving and there's no airflow. We know that that's a central apnea where an obstructive apnea, we see the chest and abdomen still moving and there's no uh, airflow from the transducer or the thermistor. We know that's an obstructive event. In the past, and there's very few sleep centers now still doing esophageal pressure monitoring. This would require like an NG tube, nasogastric tube to be put down into the esophagus just above the uh, stomach and to monitor pressure within the thoracic cavity, within the chest walls. And this is the most definitive way to monitor um, obstructive events, even upper airway resistance. It's considered the gold standard, but it's rarely done just because it's a little more invasive. It's not very comfortable. Um, and so it's just not routinely done anymore. We also have a snore mic, to, and there's really no objective measurement of snoring at this point. Some companies and some things have decibel measurements, but really there's no standardization there. And then there's a pulse ox, typically on the finger. And in kids, we will do end tidal CO2 um, in some adults with congestive heart failure, we can do entitled CO2. That's really just measuring the carbon dioxide levels. And if someone's retaining that carbon dioxide levels, that can be a sign of hypoventilation or something related to that. We also have an ECG. This is lead two on the ECG. Look for any arrhythmias. Uh, abnormal beats, uh, atrial fibrillation, things like that. And then there's body position. There's sensors out there that can monitor body position. But most of the time, uh, we're relying on the video to determine the exact body position. Here you can see, you know, all the wires. You guys are all probably very familiar with the PSG. And here on the top, you can see the uh, EEG from the frontal leads. Um, there's no EEG uh, shown beyond that. Um, the EOGs, the eye movements in, um, in E1 and E2 there, you can see the chin electrode uh, to look at the muscle tone at the submentalis, the EKG in the across lead two, a snore mic, and then further down, you can see the chest and abdomen uh, movements, uh, the pressure transducer, the thermistor, the O2, and any leg movement. So you can see it's a pretty heavy analysis. It's head to toe, essentially, of, uh, of the body's physiologic parameters that are occurring during sleep. This is all the data, and this, you know, there's even more than this, but, you know, this is kind of a robust report in terms of the amount of information we can capture from a PSG. Obviously, we know when they fell asleep, how long it took them to fall asleep. 
We can measure their efficiency of how long they're asleep. Typically, a good sleep study is considered higher than 85% efficiency on the sleep efficiency. Um, we want them to fall asleep ideally in less than 30 minutes. Um, how many stage shifts occurred? So if they were going from stage one to stage two or from wake to stage one, how often was that happening to them? I can kind of give you a sense of how fragmented their sleep is, the number of awakenings that they had during the night. And again, for someone to remember if they're waking up during the night, it re really requires them to stay awake for three minutes or more. Um, but uh, if it's less than three minutes, they usually will not recall that. Um, and then, you know, all the stages of sleep, how much time they spend in each stage. And we know in the sleep lab, it's not going to be, you know, a typical night necessarily. And then obviously we look at the apnea, hypopnea index. We can look at um, how in each body position, if there was an effect on the apneas. So, as you typically know that if you're on your back, the apneas are going to get worse. On your side, it's going to get better. And then, you know, obviously the, the stages of sleep. Here's a great example of just looking at during REM, the desaturations are occurring, the apneas are occurring a little more concentrated during REM sleep. Um, a very common scenario in obstructive sleep apnea and central sleep apnea REM sleep tends to be protective. So we usually see less central apnea in REM and more in non-REM, where in obstructive apnea, we tend to see more in REM versus non-REM, like quick and dirty way to know how much is obstructive, how much is central. So diving into home sleep testing, and there's basically three types of categories. There's a level two home sleep study, a level three and a level four. Level two is essentially a polysomnography. It's basically an in-lab sleep study, but at home. Few less electrodes, but very, very close though. And, uh, but no video recording and no technician or someone monitoring them during the study. So it's all done at home and with really without the uh, added layer of video or the added layer of someone watching. Type three, which many of you are familiar with, uh, the classic examples like an apnea link or an Alice Night One. These are monitoring airflow, a chest belt, and a pulse ox. There is no sleep recorded with the type three HST, so it's really limited on the actual sleep data, and this is where it can underestimate uh, the severity of apnea typically because you're not capturing the sleep. And then a level four, uh, which is essentially a very limited study, um, pulse ox um, and, um, and uh, one other channel. So it's very limited in terms of the data we get. So again, a classic type three that we use in our clinic is the apnea link made by ResMed. Um, this uh, monitors airflow. Um, again, a chest belt, as you can see in that picture there, and a pulse ox. So again, we don't know when they officially fall asleep or if they woke up during the night. Um, obviously, there's usually movement artifact or people are moving around. We'll exclude some of that data. And then, uh, but it will monitor for apneas, hypopneas, um, oxygen saturation. So we can get some data to determine if there is an issue or not. Here's one that's similar in terms of... Um, uh, the apnea link in the sense that it has an airflow sensor, but it's really requir require a recording EEG as well. So the sleep stages are a little more precise. We know if they're awake or in non-REM or REM sleep, um, but it is not requiring a chest belt. So there's no abdomen or chest belt. And um, there is a pulse ox to measure the oxygen saturation. We could see on the forehead there, 
that's where the EEG recording is occurring as well. And um, this ARI study is commonly used still today. Um, some and it can uh, even tell head position, you know, if their head was turned to the left or right or on their back. Again, pretty decent data in terms of apnea, hypopnea, sleep stages, oxygen uh, saturation, um, and um, pulse rate, but no chest or abdomen belt, no EMG. So the technology that I really want to focus on because a lot of things are moving towards this space is photoplethysmography or PPG. And it's basically a measurement technique that can be used to measure the volume of changes in different parts of the body. So it's not just specific in one area. It can be used anywhere in the body. It's an instrument for measuring changes in volume within an organ or the whole body. So there's different types of photo of plethysmography. There's photoplethysmography, which is the one we're going to focus on. There's air displacement plethysmography, strain gauge, impedance plethysmography. So a wide array of measuring the volume of changes in different parts of the body, but photoplethysmography is really what we're going to focus on. So what's the principle around photoplethysmography? Most changes in blood flow occur mainly in the artery, so it's going to measure in the artery, not in the vein. These sensors are optically detecting changes in blood flow volume via reflection form or transmission through the tissue. So there's basically a red light or a green light. There's different lights, uh, colors, but most commonly it's the red light that you'll see that sends a signal of that light through the arteri ar artery to measure differences in blood flow volume. That's essentially what's um, being done. And the changes in the light intensity are associated with changes in small perfusion changes. So the, that type of little change can determine if there's an issue or not. The transmissive mode, which is commonly used as the finger, the toes, or the earlobe, requires the light on one side and something to capture the light on the other side. So that's why you have something on the front and on the back of the finger or on the earlobe. Reflective is typically done at the forehead or at the cheek. It's a one directional light that is measuring the changes in the volume. So in transmissive, you can see uh, the light is on that top in that green circle there, to, uh, tube there, and the light is being transmitted down and then captured uh, by a um, uh, photodiode on the other side. So basically, the light is being transmitted through the skin into the blood vessel, into the artery, and majority of it is um, uh, being sent directly through. And very few is being reflected back, but those changes are what it's being, what is being monitored. When you look at reflective, the photodiode is on the other side, and it's actually only capturing um, what's being reflected back. Um, so anything that's transmitting through the capillary, through the artery, is being lost. So that signal is being lost, and only the signals that are coming back to the photodiode is being captured. So you can see what's being reflected back. That's why this is called reflective PPG. So if you think of PPG, most technologies today, like your Apple Watch or Fitbit or Whoop or whatever you're using, is using PPG as the technology, okay? So 
again, there's a direct current that is detecting the signals from the tissue directly. And then there's an alternating current that's detecting signals from blood volume changes. So the change in blood volume is determining the signal, basically. And so when it's pulsatile, like your arteries send a pulse, um, those variations, those changes are what it's being monitored by the PPG. And these small changes are what's creating a signal to determine different um, parameters of biometrics. Um, and so you can measure oxygen through this way. You can measure sympathetic tone and parasympathetic tone. So basically the body's uh, fight or flight system versus what's going on in the background when you're calm or relaxed, those changes can affect the amount of pulsatile changes in, in the signal here. So that's essentially what PPG, the foundation of what PPG is. Why is it so commonly used? It's cheap. That's really the number one reason. It's inexpensive. It's cheap. It doesn't require a lot of power. And it's easy to distribute because the sensors are very small. It's easy to uh, do these tests at home. Really, no one needs to teach anyone how to use them. They're not technically very difficult. And there's a lot of different things, a lot of different data we can capture from PPG. So the classic PPG type sensors on the market I'm gonna go over that are FD approved, used for home sleep testing today. Probably the most common one you guys are most likely familiar with is the watch pad. And it uses what's called a PAT signal, which is a little bit different than PPG, but essentially the same concept. Um, it can determine the apnea hypopneas. It can determine a central apnea index. Um, and it monitors the apneas throughout the night. Snoring and body position can be monitored with the watch pad, oxygen and heart rate and sleep stages. So you can get a wide array of data using the watch pad um, in terms of determining a lot of variables. And again, it's using that same signal and the PPG concept that we talked about in that finger probe that you can see in this picture on the left. Again, other variables that you get with the watch pad are body position, snoring to statistics, sleep stages, the uh, RDI, the respirati uh, respiratory disturbance index, and AHI, and um, the severity scale there. And then the, another common one that has kind of came about during right just before the pandemic um, was the night owl. This is commonly used today still. Um, one advantage, it is um, very small, it's easy to administer, it sits right on the finger. This is, again, PPG-based technology. It is um, FDA-approved, and it can determine an apnea and hypopnea index. It can determine an oxygen desaturation, sleep stages, just very... Um, generically, though, in terms of non-REM versus REM and total sleep time. So it does give uh, a fair amount of data. The limitations of, of, of a night owl is that it can't detect central apnea. It doesn't have a snoring monitor. Uh, there's no body position data. So again, it's, it has its role, but you need to know that there are some limitations to this technology. Another common one that we use in our clinic is called a sleep image. Um, this uses a, uh, a ring that's FDA approved called the WellU ring, which is a, um, a standard ring that actually anyone can buy on Amazon. Um, the, it's a pulse ox basically, but it's the PPG sensor in there that 
sleep image uses to determine an algorithm. And the algorithm is based on CPC, which is cardiopulmonary coupling. It's a unique algorithm that com- um, bases it on, again, the com- combining the pulmonary and cardiac signals that are determined by that PPG to come up with a sleep stage kind of quality metrics, uh, fact fragmentation, and then obviously an apnea hypopnea index. So what are the limitations of the sleep image? Um, there's no... Um, there's no body position data, no snoring data, but it can determine central apnea, it can determine obstructive apnea, and it has a pulse ox as well. A new one that recently came out on the market is uh, it's called the Wesper, and basically this is using uh, these um, pads or uh, uh, these sticky um, placements on the abdomen and on the chest or on the side of the chest. It actually measures the breathing pattern on the chest. So this is not PPG based. This is actually measuring changes in air airway patterns and breathing patterns. And that's how it actually determines an apnea hypopnea index or respiratory effort index. Um, It also can determine sleep stages, and that is using PPG. The only thing it does not have is a built-in pulse ox. So you actually have to wear a finger sensor uh, with it to monitor the oxygen but it does give positional data um, and it can determine central apnea uh, versus obstructive apnea and um, and it gives a score of an AHI or REI. But again, this is not using PPG to determine the AHI. It's actually measuring the breathing um, changes that occur in the abdomen or chest using these patches that you tape to your skin. Um, But it does have sleep stages that is um, uh, using uh, different technology. This is also probably one of the uh, newest ones, uh, one of the newer ones that the FDA just approved um, called the Accurable. And it uses sound. It's an acoustic sensing monitor that uses physiologic sounds from the body. You can see it's placed at the neck, um, and that is monitoring uh, sounds coming from the neck. So it can determine snoring. Um, It can determine an AHI uh, from using the sound changes in the airflow. And uh, it can determine central apnea because the sounds are different when someone's having obstructive apnea compared to a central apnea. So this is a very new and uh, novel concept in terms of monitoring. And it does not have a pulse ox built into that sensor. So it does require you to wear something on the finger. But outside of that, this can monitor pretty much everything that a watch pad or a sleep image um, can do, but using acoustic, using the sound, um, which is an interesting novel concept and a new way to think about how to monitor patients. Um, Again, it just got FDA approval um, and they're about to launch in the US. Uh, It's been being used in the UK for a few years already. Um, And so they have kind of a track record of data and multiple studies showing how reliable it is. And they've compared it to the polysomnography um, as the gold standard to show that how accurate it is. And that's one thing I want to, I didn't mention earlier is that when something's FDA approved, 
um, it's typically being compared to the polysomnography. So um, they're using it against um, uh, the gold standard. There are some that will rely on an HST, but the majority of tests that I've talked about today uh, have been validated against the polysomnography, against the in-lab PSG. And probably, uh, this is also one of the newest ones on the market that just also got FDA approval about a year ago. Uh, it's called the Sunrise. It's a group out of Belgium that created this technology. And it's an accelerometer, essentially, that goes on the chin. And it's monitoring your mandibular movements, your jaw movements to determine an AHI, okay? So your jaw will move in certain ways or patterns when you're having an apnea. And this sensor will determine an apnea using these muscle movements that are occurring in your jaw. Again, a very novel and interesting concept um, that sensor is all it has on the chin. It will determine oxygen saturation from there. Um, it will determine sleep stages. Um, and it can even, they argue, determine upper airway resistance, which if you remember, um, the esophageal balloon, that thing that we would have to send down to the, uh, through the esophagus into the stomach, to monitor chest pressure was the gold standard of upper airway resistance diagnosis. This can uh, potentially diagnose upper airway resistance using your chin movements, um, your jaw movements. So a very novel and new concept. Again, recently FDA approved, now officially available in the United States. So you may see reports that determine um, uh, an apnea or, you know, determined sleep apnea using this technology and the reports will look a little bit different. So I'd like to finish with a concept is, is there more to sleep apnea than a number? And I think this is an area that we're starting to evolve with. Because look, we're using new sensors like sound sensors, jaw movement sensors. We're not relying on nasal airflow as much as we did before. So what are we trying to achieve with all these new different ways to monitor breathing and oxygen and sleep? It's all about, is there more than an AHI? You know, is sleep quality, is sleep stages, is how much time spent with an oxygen, how frequent are you waking up because of your apnea? Is that more important than an AHI sometimes? And I think we're not quite there yet at, you know, determining um, what is the best number. Is there a bunch of different things that we need to incorporate and create a number out of that? Um, I think those things are starting to emerge and determining also phenotypes. You know, there's different causes for sleep apnea. Some people, it's purely the obstruction because their tonsils are large or their neck is large or their tongue is large. There's also neuromuscular control. So, you know, how well is the brain sending a signal to the muscles to stay open? There's also something called loop gain, how well the feedback mechanisms of the airway sensors that monitor carbon dioxide, monitor um, muscle movements, are sending signals to the brain to either overreact or underreact to those changes. So there's many, many different reasons why someone might have sleep apnea. So and and so the AHI may not reflect that necessarily uh, very well. And so I, I think, you know, just for my take-home message here, it's just, you know, we do rely on AHI very heavily, but it may not be the only number that we need to think about, or, you know, maybe it's one piece of many different things that we have to incorporate 
determining how is this impacting an individual um, because there's so many people with this problem. Thank you for your time today. I hopefully you learned something and uh, looking forward to any questions um, that you may have regarding this. Thank you. Hello, I'm Leo Nizzi with Medical Service Company, Manager of Payer Relations. I'm here with Dr. Roy to kick off our sleep track this afternoon. And what a great way to, uh, to kick it off, Dr. Roy. I know home sleep testing might not only be something that people are looking more into using from the clinical perspective, but maybe are being even forced into using a little bit more from the clinical perspective. So a, definitely a great way to start the afternoon. I know a lot of people are very excited. We've seen a lot of questions roll in. So I appreciate you being with us and uh, you ready? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, well, we have some great ones, so I can't wait to hear your answers on some of these. Uh, first question for you, Dr. Roy, when considering all of these new HST technologies, how do you determine which one to use for your patients? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think there's a couple variables that, that come into play for us. Um, one is, you know, what are we trying to do? One is from a, there's the diagnostic world where we're trying to diagnose sleep apnea. We use HSTs quite a bit on the therapeutic side as well, right? So if someone's with an oral appliance or on a CPAP or Inspire, and we want to see, even with CPAP, sometimes the AHI on the CPAP download is, is doesn't match with what the patient's telling us, which of these technologies can be used in conjunction with some of these other therapeutics? That will sometimes decide, will I use a sleep image or a watch pad or uh, a type 2 HST? depending on that scenario. Some of these don't work with CPAP. Some of them don't, uh, the Inspire might interfere with the signal quality, uh, like the Wesper hasn't been really been validated with Inspire. So we're testing those ideas out just, and then ease of use, right? If we have a patient who doesn't want to download an app and connect via Bluetooth, you know, there's certain home tests that don't require any of that. And then ultimately the pair, right? The pair, we have to, there's a practical side of this where the pairs will only reimburse for one of these HSTs. And so giving us this flexibility allows us to try different technologies, get comfortable with them. And then each one kind of has its pros and cons. Um, you know, again, like the night owl is disposable. If I don't want to have to worry about getting it back from the patient. Uh, I don't mind not knowing if they have central apnea or not. I already kind of rule that out. I'm not concerned about it. The night owl could be a very nice tool to use over over months or years when I have someone on an oral appliance that I want to check every every year or every so often. So uh, these are all the all the things we kind of think about, and we'll choose one or the other. Um, I, I like the idea we have options. Um, some clinics really just want to have one and, and stick to one tool, but uh, I'm definitely one one person who likes the idea of new technologies, new concepts. They've been validated, study that data to make sure how accurate was it. And then we use any new technology in the sleep lab typically simultaneously if we're not, if it's new and to make sure are we getting a same signal quality that the studies showed. Yeah, makes total sense. You know, a good follow-up question that somebody had for that. And I guess a, a better way to phrase it is, do you have a specific unit that you like to use? And if you do, what is it? Honestly, I, I, I kind of treat all of them equally. <laughs> um, the one that I've leaned a little bit more towards, I, uh, and for me, I think uh, the sleep image has some slight advantages in the sense of the sleep quality metrics that are kind of unique uh, to that device. They, they give like a quality index, a fragmentation index. And to me, you know, again, beyond the AHI, if I can get a better in-depth understanding of what's happening to their sleep, is it unstable, stable, how much deep sleep versus light sleep versus REM sleep, some of these others outside of an in-lab PSG really can't get to that answer very accurately or very detailed. And, and what's interesting is the sleep image kind of has a unique algorithm that kind of helps with that. The others potentially will have some more information in that sleep quality side of things. But of all the devices I mentioned, the only one that kind of has that piece of it, um, and it seems to correlate pretty well with patient complaints. So if someone's telling me, hey, I'm feeling tired still, I'm waking up a lot, 
and I'm like, maybe it's your CPAP's not working right. So we'll do that. And it looks like the HI is two on the CPAP, but there are fragmentations off the chart. Oh, maybe I need to add a sleep aid or maybe pain's waking them up, you know, trying to figure out what's going on there. It, it shifts my attention that, hey, the CPAP's actually doing what it's supposed to do. Your sleep quality is just not getting better with the CPAP. We have to do something else now to help you feel better. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. You know, we don't always get people to get into specifics of what they prefer against some other options, but I know uh, there's definitely positives and negatives to everything out there right now. So thank you for sharing your opinion on that. Uh, next question that rolled in for you is how well do PPG devices correlate with in-lab PSGs better or worse than standard type three studies? Yeah, great question. So in our studies, and we, we really, you know, have only used a few um, in lab, you know, I, I haven't done a study on 100 people, we've done studies on two, three, four, five people, where we'll simultaneous, simultaneously use a PPG based technology against the PSG, just in our own lab setting. And we're seeing about an 85% concordance rate. So it's not perfect. It's, but it's, reasonable. It's pretty good. And then the other value I think I get out of home testing is the ability to do it over a few nights, right? So in the lab, you're, you're really taking a snapshot of them, A, in a foreign environment, wired head to toe, and you have one night with them. Mm -hmm. At home, it's their own bed, their own recliner sometimes, you know, where, wherever they're sleeping. And then you get multiple nights of information. And I think at the end of the day, it's how does this correlate with their symptoms, right? Like, and there's discrepancies here, even in the in-lab setting, we'll see someone who's fallen asleep driving, can't stay awake, and they're HI6, right? But then you treat them and their sleepiness resolves. So the, the assumption that the HI also correlates with severity in terms of how it's impacting an individual is, is commonly, there's a huge discordance there for a lot of patients. You know, we'll see patients with an AHI of 80, 100, they're probably, they're probably going to have a heart attack in the next two months, yet they feel great, like they have no complaints. And then you have patients who, again, barely have a, a mild degree of uh, from a sleep apnea AHI index, but yet are, are not functioning well. And when you treat them, they feel better. And then the group that's asymptomatic otherwise, you kind of have to educate them that we're treating this because we know the cardiovascular benefits, the benefits on your brain, but you may not perceive a difference with the therapy. And if you don't educate them on that, I think, uh, and, and the patient will be like, why am I using this if I don't see a difference? And it's sometimes like the way I describe it to them is like taking a baby aspirin to prevent a heart attack. You don't really feel better. You don't see a difference when you take a baby aspirin, but yet you know it's hopefully protecting you from a heart attack in the future. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you for elaborating on that. You know, and uh, this next question, it, it's kind of interesting because I think it builds the bridge between your presentation and Dr. Strolls from a little bit earlier where he mentioned uh, some of the other little things as he quoted uh, that we do to treat sleep apnea. So this question was, given the insurance company's reliance on certain AHI criteria for treatment to be covered, how would you manage a patient with a normal or low AHI that is experiencing sleep issues? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Especially when, you know, if we're looking at a 4% desaturation versus a 3%, we really see some issues there. Um, also, if you see more upper airway resistance, their AHI is under five, but they're fragmented quite a bit. So the ways we try to get around that, um, one tool will we'll go into, one of my toolbox options is using a medication called protriptyline, which is an old tricyclic antidepressant. I may have mentioned this on a talk last year or the year before, where it is a drug therapy that increases hypoglossal tone using norepinephrine. So there's a, a couple of drugs now being tested in the sleep apnea space, looking at how to improve upper airway collapsibility using pharmacologic options. And protriptyline, which is an old drug since been around since the 70s, increases norepinephrine uh, as a, not increases, but as a reuptake inhibitor, similar to adamoxetine or Stratera ADD drug. Uh, by, increase, uh, by preventing norepinephrine breakdown, you actually increase hypoglossal tone. You can improve snoring in even a mild degree of sleep apnea. So in patients where I'm really stuck, 
They're not going to pay for a CPAP. They're not going to pay for an oral appliance. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm going to use protriptyline quite a bit. The other option, which is what the luxury we have in our office is loaner CPAP machines. You know, we have CPAP machines that we have sitting in the back room. We'll tell a patient, do you want to give it a month and see how you feel with it? Mm -hmm. And what we can do then is have them use it for a month. If they come back in a month and they're like, this made a huge difference. I feel better. This is truly important to me. It'll do one of two things. We can go back to the insurance company and say, hey, they had very borderline AHI. They have symptoms. We treated them with a loaner machine. Look at the benefit they've had. Will you cover a CPAP? If that doesn't work, then the patient also then has a little more motivation to say, I'll just pay out of pocket and buy one, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's another tool uh, that we'll look at. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, when, when insurances were pretty, you know, we're beholden to them approving these kind of therapies, it's really what can we do outside of the box to try to help these patients feel better and maybe bridge the gap till the insurance can cover something. Wonderful. And I appreciate you mentioning the, the difference between the 3% and 4% desaturation, because I think that's where we find a lot of those patients that fall into that gray area of what do we do to treat their symptoms when we know they don't qualify? And I think one of the overarching themes around OSA today is, you know, providers looking into their toolbox, as you mentioned, to just find creative ways to, to get them to the end result we're looking for. So I appreciate you elaborating on that. So uh, unfortunately, we're out of time for this Q&A. Uh, we barely got through any of the questions, which it's great to see the people interacting with this topic. So a great start to the sleep track. Thank you so much, Dr. Roy, for joining us. Fantastic topic to kick off this part of the conversation with. And uh, thank you again for joining us. Thank you for caring for your patients. And I look forward to working with you in the future. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Take care. <laughs>